A very good morning to everybody with us today. My name is Rad Othman, I'm the Head of Programs at the Pearl Initiative, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our workshop, Tackling Conscious and Unconscious Gender Bias in the Workplace in partnership with NAMA Women Advancement. Before we begin, I'd like to start off by first introducing the Pearl Initiative. The Pearl Initiative is the Gulf region's leading independent nonprofit organization working to improve corporate accountability and transparency across the private sector, family firms, MSMEs, philanthropic nonprofit organizations in the Gulf region. The Pearl Initiative was, was established over 10 years ago by regional business leaders and the UN Office of Partnerships. More recently, we are one of the few organizations in the Gulf region to receive a special consultative status from the UN Office for Economic and Social Council. The Pearl Initiative runs programs focusing on governance related matters, conducts regionally based research, convenes business leaders, government, civil society leaders and students to discuss challenges and opportunities in implementing best practice in the workforce. We also run workshops, trainings and support business professionals as they take the lead in implementing corporate governance, accountability and best practice. Through the Pearl Initiative's diversity and business leadership program and our Women at Work series, we are collaborating with, with NAMA Women's Advancement to convene professionals to share experience and best practice. Today, we'll be discussing how we can best tackle conscious and unconscious bias in the gender workplace. This panel discussion will highlight the importance of addressing bias in the workplace as part of businesses' corporate governance approach to ensure growth and sustainability of a business. Unconscious and conscious gender biases that occur within the, within the workplace and, and the key data driven strategies and tactics that can be employed by business leaders to ensure that biases are mitigated. The session will also highlight how successful businesses and put in place practices and measures to tackle gender bias to improve governance and accountability in the workplace. We'll highlight experiences and successful business practices on how to address the bias and promote different tools and methods to how we can mitigate these kinds of biases in the workplace. We'll also explore how business leaders implement policies to advance women at work and ways to enhance their effectiveness. With this, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator, Maria Hadjo, the founder of C and CEO of Transform8. Maria is originally from Sweden and has lived in 10 different cities before finally making Dubai her home. Since graduating the esteemed Ecole Hotelier at De Lausanne in 2001, Maria has gained a wealth of experience in the wellness and hospitality industry across multiple continents through a variety of luxury brands. She has an MSc in neuroscience and psychology of mental health from King's College London, where she wrote a paper on the effects of stereotype and threat work with working women and how positive psychology interventions can mitigate these effects and help close the gender gap in leadership. Maria has been an ongoing wellness entrepreneur 
And with growing demand from the corporate world to unleash their infinite, infinite potential, Maria has launched Transformate in 2018. The company focuses on human mastery programs which drive transformations for conscious, connected and more productive people, teams, organizations, communities. Our projects have included supporting the UAE Ministry of Happiness in their mission. In 2001, after 18 months of creation, Transformate launched the Women Empowerment Program and the Conscious Leader Program. These programs help the organization to take a collaborative, expansive and human approach to building a resilient future, future from the inside out. Maria is an extremely passionate uh, person about creating more equality in senior management and leadership and believes fully that we need men and women to show equality in full leadership positions and decision making in their roles for a brighter future. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Maria, to introduce our panel. Uh, well, thank you very much, Rada, and good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. And yes, I am indeed very passionate about the topic on the cards on the table this morning, not only as a woman in business, but also as a, as a human being, uh, you know, wanting to create a more balanced uh, world. And I'm really thrilled to be having this conversation here today with our esteemed panel. So allow me to introduce um, our panel. So we have May uh, Anmuzaini, who is the founder and CEO of the Arab Institute for Women Empowerment, NUSIF. Um, it's a premier women's executive leadership body uh, founded to equip Saudi and Arab women to develop professionally, to lead in the corporate world, and to make a lasting positive impact on society and the economy. Uh, May is also the manager of regulatory affairs at Saudi Aramco, and um, was also, I should say, um, which is, of course, as we know, the world's largest energy provider. And under May's leadership, she worked with her team to serve as the company's think tank and, and decision support center, monitoring the regulatory and public policy landscape providing analysis and strategies and recommendations on issues that impact the government and the company. Uh, and this included the de development of in-depth research papers, strategic dialogues, uh, sectorial briefing, speech writing, and communication support for the chairman and the CEO, as well as other members of the corporate management. So welcome, May. And I'd also love to introduce uh, Sada Al-Shamari, um, who is the HR business partnership at Sabic, and she has over seven years experience in the human resources field in people development, uh, HR operations and business partnership. And during her experience, as she has led several HR projects and initiatives that touches employee welfare, uh, that work life balance, which is now more important than ever before, and other strategic priorities. Um, she's also contributed to different events and conferences organized by Sabic to promote young leadership, empowering women and advocating for workplace uh, diversity. And she's also the leader of SHE, which is Sabic's women's network. And she represents Sabic in the Ramco's Grow initiative in the conscious and unconscious bias work stream. So, and Sata has a passion for personal development as we've heard women's growth. So thank you so much for being with us uh, this morning, Sada. And last but not least, uh, Huma Hamid, uh, who is the engineering program manager at Cisco. And Huma is a tech maker by heart with a passion for building digital products, high performance teams and thriving global communities. And during her 15 years or over 15 years in tech, she has been part of several um, R&D and engineering groups and she's currently the engineering program manager at the learning and certification team at Cisco and leading the digital um, transformation program uh, to build next generation learning, to build a next generation learning platform and applications using, using cloud uh, interface or infrastructure. Uh, she is also the co-founder and the former president of Pakistani Women in Computing, uh, which is a US-based but global, uh, global nonprofit organization. Uh, and she's also the global advisor to Cisco Wise, a uh, girls in STEM initiative. And she leads the women's Cisco She Speaks initiative. And um, she's an active 
um, mentor and speaks on product management, career growth and transformation, and breaking barriers through unconscious bias related topics. So welcome, Huma. And I cannot imagine a more suitable panel with the experience that these ladies have for us to have this conversation here today. And um, so we will dive into their expansive um, experiences and have this conversation about this very important topic of addressing gender biases in the workplace, um, which is part of a business's corporate governance approach uh, in order to ensure growth and sustainability of business and of gender equality, of course. Um, we will look at how unconscious and conscious biases around gender can impact the workplace. Uh, and we will explore some key data-driven uh, strategies and tactics that can be employed by business leaders like yourselves um, to mitigate uh, these biases. Uh, we will hear from the, the panelists' experiences of how they've implemented these things in their businesses and in their workplaces uh, and the effects that th those have had to make uh, gender equality a priority. And so why are we talking about this? You know, it's such a big topic at the moment. We hear it everywhere. So why is it so important? And I think we could probably spend the entire hour just talking about the why we're talking about it because the list is very long. <laughs> um, but just to kind of go over some of the statistics. So 42% of women, uh, this is the US statistics, uh, and I'm sure it's even larger if we look at it uh, from a global perspective, experience gender discrimination in the workplace. Uh, all over the world, in every single sector and in every single country, uh, men tend to earn more money than women. Uh, women are often underrepresented in senior leadership positions uh, within organizations and firms, but also within government. Um, and in fact, they represent about 20 to 30 percent of leadership and only 8% of CEO positions in Fortune 500 companies are currently held by women. And only 11% of countries around the world have female heads of state. And uh, Sweden had one, but she only lasted a few days. Um, so women represent 50% of the population, in fact. So it's quite surprising how huge this imbalance continues to be. Uh, it's also a huge untapped talent pool because if 50% of the population is not currently being equally represented, uh, we have a huge amount of talent because 50% of higher education is achieved by women. Um, women are also often overrepresented in the low paying jobs. And they often have less land ownership, less rights to inheritance. Uh, and although we are making progress, uh, the United Nations have recently come out with a, the, a new shocking uh, statistic that it will take over 135 years for us to reach gender equality around the world. Uh, the World Bank's recent um, research on women, business and the law reported uh, gender discrimination in 187 countries, and it found only six, Belgium, Denmark, France, Latvia, Luxembourg, and Sweden scored uh, full marks in these eight indicators, which including receiving pension, uh, freedom of movement, and other um, aspects that influence economic decision makers and uh, making uh, of women and during their careers. Um, McKenzie actually came out a few years back stating that gender diversity can add $12 trillion uh, to GDP by 2025. Um, also, for every female film character, there are 2.24 men. And while this might not seem so relevant to our discussion today around um, gender equality in the workplace, of course, we pick up our biases and our stereotypes based on everything that we see. And TV and cinema is a huge influencer of these stereotypes. And um, so it really is something that we need to become more conscious of. Both when men and women are twice as likely to hire a male candidate, including some men and uh, women as well. 40% of men and women notice the double standard around uh, female candidates. Men see unconscious bias as one of the top barriers facing women in their careers. Uh, women take on the majority of childcare and family care. They're significantly more burnt out now more so than ever, especially with the impact of the pandemic. So let's talk about this. Um, and I wanted to sort of start off um, with you know just addressing what this unconscious and conscious biases are all about 
Uh, now, just as a brief introduction, of course, biases are 100% natural. We all have them. Um, so it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's just part of our programming. In fact, it's our early programming. It's our brain's way um, of organizing and sorting and filtering information in order to be make it easier and, and less energy um, wasting, let's say. Our brains are always trying to be energy efficient, and this is part of it. Um, so instead of constantly having to reassess everything from scratch, uh, our brains help us with these shortcuts, uh, which is, of course, highly useful until they're incorrect. Uh, so one of the bases of addressing conscious biases is the awareness and unconscious biases, of course, is bringing them into our awareness, because only then can we verify their correctness before we apply them. Um, and this is what makes unconscious biases uh, potentially more troublesome than conscious ones. So I wanted to bring it now over to our panel and perhaps you can share a little bit about your experience in terms of uh, conscious and unconscious biases in the workplace. Um, Sada, do you want to have a, a, a kickoff? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Maria. These numbers are outstanding. Um, and Honestly, none of them are surprising. And I think that applies to a lot of people um, thinking a bit, uh, about it. And when we talk about um, a conscious and unconscious uh, bias and what it means to us, I mean, we are so used to talking about it that um, everything almost is, is conscious to us. We, you know, we see the way people act and, the way, and immediately we kind of translate it into uh, what does that mean for gender diversity? What does that mean for equality? And so many other things. Um, but then uh, you look at a lot of people who don't consciously think about these topics. And it's our responsibility to kind of um, call them out and say, listen, do you ever consider that you know, some movie stars uh, are, you know, you have more move men movie stars than women. And once they start consciously thinking about it, it becomes, um, it, it turns uh, another page. So um, in terms of my own personal experience, I was first, uh, I was um, part of the first batch of female employees in Jubail Industrial City in Sabic. So that's a huge industry in Jubail um, with, you know, uh, a lot of um, manufacturing sites and a male dominated industry. And then um, you get a bunch of uh, female employees who need to adapt to the industry and they also need to adapt. And we do the training in the beginning and that's normal and natural, but you know, when the day-to-day -day tasks come in, uh, it's, it's different. Uh, that's when the unconscious piece, pieces uh, come out. And you kind of, I mean, I, I could talk about examples for ages, and we will uh, address some of them uh, in a bit. But I guess that's that's my kind of interpretation of what is the difference between conscious and unconscious biases. And I think May uh, can can reflect here as well. What do you think? Yeah, great. Yeah, well, thanks, um, uh, uh, um, Shada and Maria. And, and you mentioned, Maria, that gender bias is one of the major issues that women face globally. It is even more magnified in the Middle East based on the traditional roles that shape us as children, uh, like girls should play with dolls and boys with cars. Uh, girls should be delicate and shy, while boys should be rough and assertive, assertive. And most importantly, they should not cry when they get hurt. So well, fast forward, these kids grow up to be the adults in the workplace, and they continue to adopt the same roles as they grow up uh, with. So I've seen firsthand in an interview with a very qualified pregnant woman, what's the first thing that comes to the mind of a male or even a female boss is, this woman is going to be away from work and is going to be busy raising a young family. Therefore, I'll hire a man instead. And as if the man doesn't also need to be with his young family as well. So generally, there's more perhaps unintended discrimination towards women that's actually um, conscious rather than unconscious because of the way we have been conditioned as children. 
And talking about biases within the same gender, I can give you an example of um, a relative of mine. She had heart problems, and when she found out that this surgeon was a woman, she refused to be operated on. And so, and similarly, I can drill it down even further with my husband who wanted a female kindergarten teacher rather than a male one for our four-year-old son back in the day, over 20 years ago. So this just drives in how, how unconsciously biased we are without even knowing it based on our society and how we've been brought up. So the bottom line for me is um, you cannot change what you don't acknowledge. Yeah, beautifully put. And, and of course, it, is, it isn't about not having them, as you say. It's about just becoming aware of and then consciously creating what it is that we want to create for the, for the future. And so how do we know that unconscious and conscious biases are taking place in our workplaces? Are there you know, some signs um, that give it away and, and there are some things that we can, can measure. I know that um, Sata, obviously in, in Saudi, things have been uh, progressing very rapidly as for the rest of the region, but particularly I think in Saudi. So perhaps you have some initiatives from Sabic um, around these sort of measurable component um, of, of conscious biases. Absolutely, absolutely we do. We, um, I mean, I think one of the best things in Sabic is that um, they acknowledge the conscious piece, so they talk about it often to kind of come up with all of these policies and regulations to ensure that uh, consciously, um, as a company, they're making the right decisions. Uh, so when you think of, um, you know, you talked about equal pay, um, uh, and I think culturally, when I first joined uh, Savic, uh, uh, the people outside of the company, people that I knew would um, kind of wonder if we would be on the same salary scale as, as men did, or if we also um, got a chance to um, uh, get our annual bonus uh, as men do, because why would you need it? You're a female employee. Uh, but the company said, you know, if you're a Sabic employee, you're a Sabic employee regardless. Um, so we follow the same salary skills. We have the same regulations applied. And one of the funnier examples that I can think of is the home ownership program. <clears throat> so the home ownership program is um, is a big deal in Sabic. Is uh, you know it's very the company is generous with its employees and um, it's a great opportunity to be part of the home ownership program. And um, uh, as a Sabic employee, I was enrolled in the program. Um, and a lot of people, culturally speaking, were just kind of uh, taken aback. Like, why would the woman be? Um, be part of the program because uh, the men are the traditional um, providers for the home. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, you receive questions and remarks and uh, things that uh, uh, you as a person who consciously think about, you, you understand where that's coming from. But for a lot of people, like you said, who don't think of this um, consciously, um, it, it's just kind of a rational question to ask, well, why are you part of the program? Why are you getting paid just as much as your male colleagues? Why are you, um, you know, uh, why, why is that? Uh, even someone ha had asked me once, does your husband pay you back for the, <laughs> for the ownership program? And I was like, uh, that, that's between me and my husband. That has nothing to do with my competence or my um, my my being part of the uh, program or my you know um, my relation to uh, Sabic. And uh, that kind of gives you an indication of what the uh, the cultural changes that Saudi is specifically going through. There are so many examples that you can think of culturally, what people think and um, how it's our responsibility to kind of um, acknowledge and point it out and talk about it really to make it more conscious for individuals. Oh, exactly. And bringing more momentum uh, to, you know, to, the, to the change. Um, great example. Thank you, Shanta. And what about you, Huma? Any experiences from your side that you want to share? Thank you, Maria. Um, so most of the experiences that I would like to count, um, just like May mentioned, you know, they start at the very early age. Um, in my in my introduction, 
I hope people have already figured out that I'm I'm working in tech, which is already you know an industry where women are um, also underrepresented. So when I started my journey in tech and when I decided to become an engineer, the first thing that I that was uh, mentioned to me um, by you know by friends and family that it's a it's a very male dominating field. What what exactly are you going to do there? Um, so that was the first hurdle or the first you know barrier that I had to cross and um, and then pursue an education which is not traditionally for uh, known for women. And then as I progressed in my career, um, you know, as I started my family and I went through hiring processes, there were there were situations where uh, you know the questions asked by the interview, you know, in the interviews, they were not unconscious they were very consciously um diverted towards trying to figure out my marital status so they can determine if i'm you know how serious i am about my job um and if i will continue my career you know after i get married um and then questions around you know when i started my family um how how much support do I have, you know, um, in, in terms of uh, taking care of my, my kids, especially when I'm traveling for work, uh, who takes care of my children? So these are the questions, um, you know, that I have, I have been asked so many times. So every time I find myself, well, parenting is, um, you know, it's, um, especially when, when my husband, he's taking care of the kids, it's, he's not like babysitting, he's, he's also an equal, participant in raising our children and he's, he's doing basically a parenting job. So yes, there are definitely questions that people ask. Um, there are questions that I have also been asked um, um, during the interviews um, and you know by, by friends and family and circle. And some of these questions, they definitely impact you in, in, in ways where you don't see yourself that you belong in a specific industry or you have um, you know, or you can look forward to the next step, uh, or you would like to grow. So the, I, I personally, I struggled for a very long time. This whole belonging thing, like, did I make the wrong choice? Do I really belong in tech? Should I stay here? Is it, is this the right, you know, career for me? Um, it has been very recent that I have, um, I have not only started to identify that these questions are based on uh, conditioning and stereotyping what people see me as you know they have a maybe they have an image of what uh, an engineer or you know a person in tech looks like or how they should be uh, or how they should <clears throat> be presented so um, having that kind of awareness both on, on both sides of the tables it also gave me an opportunity to understand the unconscious biases that I may have uh, you know, for other people, maybe for other women, maybe for other, uh, you know, people with different backgrounds. So it's definitely an important conversation and so many examples that we, we can all give from our uh, professional experiences, um, you know, for, for the sake of this conversation. Yeah, that's wonderful. And if this is exactly what we refer to as a stereotype threat, this kind of um, nervousness and do I belong here? Is this for people like me, etc.? So well done you, Huma, for leading the way and being such a great example for uh, future generations of women as well who want to get into STEM and the, the tech uh, field because we need role models to change those stereotypes. Um, and anything from, from you, uh, May, in terms of uh, uh, perhaps how, you know, childhood or other examples of how unconscious and conscious biases were formed? You know, uh, believe it or not, um, I, there was something way back in my mind, and as I was preparing for this uh, panel, I realized that it was reinforced that I just discovered that there is also bias towards beauty. Uh, people who are more attractive get more opportunities, get more promotions than others. And it was just in the back of my mind, but I didn't put the piece as something that made sense. But it's actually true. So what do we do about things like that that we can't control? This is um, perhaps during the interview process, you might want to remove any photos or just put a person as a, um, a badge number or an entity where you can have 
psychometric analysis rather than just focusing on the character. Because me as a person, when I was interviewing, I used to be attracted to people who had similar characteristics as mine. And this is where we need to stay away from and look at the exact opposite. What are the other things that they have that I don't have? And what can it add to my team? That would be very important. Why would I want to bring somebody additional who has the same characteristics as mine? And they're, I, I'm already adding that. So adding a different perspective to the pool will definitely make the, um, the team or the company more creative, um, uh, more, more, there's even more retention, there is more interest, there's more collaboration, there's, there's so much um, more to give when um, we offer different uh, perspectives and opinions and all of that. But, but I just wanted to put in that attractiveness component that, that I, I was shocked to read about but most importantly the the role really comes on the companies they need to ensure that they have an objective recruiting and appraisal process and make sure that these policies around employee benefits and flexible working hours should also be reviewed to ensure that there's equal opportunities for everyone Absolutely. And I mean, if you look at, you know, I always encourage organizations to look at where they're located and are the organizations reflecting that landscape. Uh, and of course, when it comes to gender, um, is your organization on every level representing 50% male and 50% female? Because that is the, the, the natural landscape of the, you know, the people around us. Um, so it is really, really important. There was also, there was some recent research that came out, um, and I forget the organization that completed it, but they were looking at um, how women have a tendency to apply for a position later than men do because they sort of think over it longer and they think, you know, is this for people like me, like whom I was describing earlier? So a simple policy of introducing a, a, a timeline where before that point, and um, you cannot look at any applications and um, actually allowed more women to get through the recruitment process. Because very often if we start earlier, it means that we may have already found our candidate by the time some of the women are applying uh, and we're no longer considering more people for interviews because of time reasons, et cetera. So there's some, some great initiatives there. Thank you so much, um, May. I wanna go back to, to Huma actually and dig a little deeper into this um, STEM and tech field. Um, you know, perhaps you can share some of, of some of your experiences around um, strategies that have been implemented to counter these biases that we know are so prevalent. Right. So um, in tech, um, you know, the first the first line where this where we need to increase diversity or where we may see the most, you know, the most. Uh, challenges in in attracting the right talent so um it has been um you know it, it basically starts with the hiring and recruiting process especially in tech like who are you attracting who are you hiring and then who are you retaining and then promoting within within your companies uh, when we talk about the hiring process and um uh, you know uh, attracting the a diverse talent um it really starts with where is your hiring funnel you know how are you building those funnels uh, which schools or which uh, which communities are you targeting and what kind of job descriptions are you putting out there is it uh, is is the language mentioned in your job descri description is it um is it to attract a specific gender for example we are looking for rock star ninja developers and this these are some of the terms that um you know, uh, women may not be able to associate, so they may already exclude themselves from even applying for these kind of jobs. And then once you have the talent, how do you make sure that you have a diverse, um, you know, um, hiring panel that is looking at all the different aspects of if this person will be a good fit for the team, just like May mentioned, and, and also the, the panel uh, or the people, you know, interviewing there, there are they trained enough to uh, identify what kind of, you know, things can make um, or 
that make unconscious you know decisions hiring decisions that are uh, more influenced by the unconscious bias like this person went to the same school or have the same um, you know background like myself so I, maybe this is going to be a better fit so having that kind of you know how are you funneling the candidates who is part of the hiring process how hiring decisions are being made um, can definitely improve in in attracting the right talent and once you have the talent and then you know, having a policies uh, around uh, maternity and paternity leave, flexibility in, in, in hours, and especially in country like Pakistan, uh, you know, one of the one of my friends um, who is a CEO, he was mentioning that he improved. Uh, you know, transportation is a huge challenge in Pakistan. Like female uh, traveling to the office or, or commuting, you know, in a, uh, they don't feel safe in in, in certain. Area. So how do we make sure that we are not losing good talent if, if commute is a challenge? So they introduce transportation just for their female uh, employees to, to make sure that, you know, that this is not becoming a reason. Um, and I have personally, you know, my, my own experience when I became, um, I was, uh, I, have, I have two sons. So when I was a new mother, of course, I was looking for uh, a more flexible work arrangement where I had the opportunity to work from home and I could schedule my work hours around my, you know, um, um, children. So, uh, and also not miss on their important milestones. So these are some of the de decisions that uh, definitely contribute and, you know, which employer you want to stay with and if you want to build your career with them. Um, and lastly, um, I would also highlight the importance of mentorship and especially sponsorship, you know, women um, getting promotion to the next level, especially middle management, like breaking out of middle management is one of the hardest layers, especially in tech, uh, and then going into the, you know, leadership roles. So, uh, and sponsorship, we all know, plays a really important role, which is not just guiding somebody or advising somebody, it's actually using your uh, position of influence and authority to uh, to, you know, help a, a candidate uh, to move forward in their career or progress in, in their career. Um, and there are companies that are, you know, implementing these sponsorship programs where um, diverse candidates, not just women, uh, diverse candidates, they can, uh, employees, they can take advantage and benefit from these sponsorship programs from their executive leadership. Um, I'm also part of one of those programs, and I, I and I believe that that's one of the one of the key uh, factor that can help many um, you know many companies improve um, who is who is participating in the, at at the leadership level. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's I, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Maria. Can I just add on to one point that Tuma mentioned, which was the transportation piece? I remember when uh, the first, um, uh, the law changed and we uh, Saudis were, um, Saudi female uh, women were allowed to drive. Uh, I remember the question was posed to, uh, to the company as, um, should we have set parking for women? And then the other question that came up was, are we being biased by thinking that? We don't know. And uh, that was a really interesting piece. Sometimes we, try to kind of overcompensate um, uh, some pieces. And, and um, I, I totally relate to what Homa, Homa mentioned uh, just now, lots of pieces, yeah. Yeah, and if I can add to that, I think right now, if we're being biased towards women, it's just to a point where we want to level the playing field right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, in Saudi Arabia, there's a program called Wasul that addresses what Huma has been talking about that provides transportation and pays for 80% of the transportation for women to go to work and come back. So these are all steps that help women uh, address these issues of their inability and for the, the country or companies to retain these talents. Yeah, it's such a great point. And I think that there is now this sort of emerging um, that men are feeling marginalized because women are given um, certain opportunities. But I think you're right, May. It's all about leveling the playing field. And once we get to that point, then, you know, we can go back to, to normal. 
Um, and I think actually somebody mentioned that earlier that hopefully in the future we won't even have to have these conversations. Yes, um, yes. Um, but I'd love to bring it over to our audience um, uh, for a second because I want to just tap in to see, you know, how many of you, um, so we'll do a little poll um, so you can share your experience as well. So how many of you have experienced uh, conscious or unconscious bias, uh, gender bias in your workplace? If you just click um, yes or no, and I'll give everybody a second to do that. Um, and also, just on another note, if you, any of you who are here participating with us today, if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to share them in the Q&A uh, part. There are a, a few questions that have come in already, which we'll address um, towards the end, but feel free to share any questions that you might have. So let's see the results of our poll. Okay, so 60%. Uh, people have experienced a gender bias in the workplace, um, which is um, pretty significant. And uh, great. So we talked a little bit about um, about training and how obviously training is a really important part of uh, bringing unconscious biases towards the conscious and becoming more aware of them. But it may not be enough. Um, so what are some of the other things that corporations really need to, to apply in order to get ahead? What are some of the initiatives or policies uh, that need to be um, implemented? Um, so I don't know if um, Huma or May wants to take this. Yeah, I, I can take it. Um, uh, absolutely. By the way, I just also discovered there, there's a new tool to measure gender bias in the workplace. And it was developed last year that may help I guess they say finally eliminated. But absolutely, uh, Maria, companies shouldn't be simply waiting for change. They must have a vital role in eliminating uh, the gender bias in the workplace. They should set targets broken down by business lines and functions, and they need to also clearly define interim milestones and deadlines so they can continually measure what they're doing against the targets that they've put. And also, uh, based on experience, they, they should ensure that the middle managers and decision makers should be held responsible and accountable for those uh, targets. And also, I think that there should be some sort of providing a shared uh, parental leave to destigmatize men, especially in the Middle East, where the assumption that this is the role of the women only. Men want to be home to take care of the family or to take care of their elderly parents and they need to take it. And sometimes they get stigmatized for doing that. This not only benefits working mothers, but fathers too. And especially um, those who, who need to take care of maybe a disability or, or aging parents. So yeah. Actually the Sweden Pavilion did a, a beautiful um, event around celebrating fatherhood of Emirati men uh, with you know men arriving with their children and photographs and it was really about bringing this awareness that you know you know and the respect to to allow fathers to be fathers because it's, yes. we sometimes assume that it's just a uh, you know a, a sort of flip of the of the responsibilities but sometimes it's as you say men want to be fathers men want to be able to be equal parents and so it's about allowing them to do that as well yeah, great. And anything from you, Huma, on this point? Um, plus one to everything that May said. Um, I, I also believe that right now with the pandemic, uh, we, we may have seen both, you know, uh, the positive and the negatives of working from home. Uh, people are burned out. Um, there is a, and, and women being primary caregiver of their families. Uh, we have definitely seen a lot of dropout of women uh, and, and we may have reversed the progress that we made in so many years, uh, you know, bringing um, women in, in the workforce. So there are, uh, but I'm also hearing, you know, especially with the experiences that I have um, working with global teams, that men, um, since they have also spent time with their families at home and they are, you know, they are becoming more and more connected with parenting responsibilities and they, they now have a first-hand experience of how um, how some of their you know um, uh, how their spouses were basically fulfilling those responsibilities. So we have seen basically both sides: some men stepping up their game, their parenting game, becoming more participative, asking for 
uh, more flexible hours. Um, I have seen you know, many of uh, my colleagues, they, they block their time um, in, in certain hours of the day because that's the time that they would like to spend with their family. So the workaholic culture is kind of taking a shift there. And then um, another example would be for, uh, you know, having, um, like we have, we have seen several examples like Mark Zuckerberg taking a parent, uh, parent to leave and, and, and becoming an example and, and you know, uh, taking that as a forefront that I, I'm absolutely celebrating being, being a father. So um, having those, taking those initiatives and then coming out and sharing it with your teams and then with your, uh, you know, as leaders definitely have a positive impact um, on how we see different roles uh, you know, in, in, um, in building a diverse uh, workforce and, and not stigmatizing men for, uh, you know, for being good parents and good, um, you know, more balanced, having more balanced family lives. Yeah, and I think obviously the pandemic has seen many more women leave the, the workplace for, for, for these exact reasons. But I think once we start to kind of get back to, to balance uh, with the pandemic topic, I think this could be also a, a positive for women that could because it could invite more flexibility. It's more acceptable now to say, I'm going to work from home, even if your company has gone back to the office because of the lockdowns that we've all experienced. So perhaps there is a silver lining there um, for, for women. Um, and what about in, in Sabic, uh, Shadad? Is there anything that you want to share in terms of, um, you know, business practices that have been integrated there have been successful? Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> I think one of the, um, you mentioned, I, I mentioned earlier on, even in my bio, that I am so proud to be the she regional um, uh, leader and representative. Um, and she is the Sabbath Women's Network. And what we did differently this time around, and um, what we used to do is, uh, we used to have all of these women gather around and talk about all of these women issues. And then we, um, uh, you know, consciously um, uh, decided that if we want to resolve a lot of these issues, then men need to be not only uh, part of the discussion, but they need to be, most of them are the decision makers here. So how can they really be involved? So what we did is we have the pillar champions. So we want um, advocates for women as leaders. We want advocates for women as influencers. And we want um, advocates for women as um, partners because partnership is an essential part of you know, the business. And um, what we did is we partnered some of the um, executives who directly report to the uh, to the CEO um, with uh, some of our uh, also other uh, uh, female employee executives and they um, they all advocate for a certain um, pillar let's say that doesn't mean that they wouldn't be advocating for the others of course but that just gives them more focus more focus on the issues more focus on the on how we can find solutions on um, even highlighting, uh, you know, uh, uh, May said a very nice piece that I wrote down here because a uh, sentence, um, you cannot change what you do not acknowledge. Um, and unless, uh, and a lot of these issues, honestly, are just generally not seriously acknowledged. And um, to put that in the spotlight and to have those decision makers advocate for these topics, I think is, um, Honestly, I think it's one of the game changers that uh, is, is coming our way. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I love that, um, the, the not being able to change something that you don't acknowledge. Um, and Huma, you touched a little bit on the, the multiplier effect program that you have for um, sponsorship, but perhaps you can share a little bit more about exactly how it works. Right. So this is a this is a program that is adopted by different companies, um, and it is to you know, multiply the diverse, um, diverse talent, especially in leadership positions. Um, there has been some, um, you know, research conducted that <clears throat> diverse candidates or workforce, they basically find it harder to progress or advance in their careers. And 
uh, one of the things that plays significant role in their advancement is the sponsorship, like a person or, or you know, or a group that can, that can find you the right opportunities that you can tap into where you can, you, you can be your best self. So this program that you know, that um, I'm also part of right now as a sponsee. Um, it, every executive leader takes a pledge that they they will sponsor at least one candidate that looks different from them. Uh, the first the first criteria, however, still is that that you know the uh, the candidate that you are uh, or you know the sponsoring the high performing. Um, really good at what they do, uh, but somehow if they are having a hard time progressing and advancing in their career and go to the next level, then you become their sponsor. You become their, you basically mention their names in, in you know, uh, for the opportunities that they may not have directly access to. And leaders, you know, executive leaders particularly, they do have more access to, you know, what kind of opportunities all across the company they're showing up and, you know, what are the different roles that can be where a specific person can be more, uh, you know, a good fit. So through this program, it's, it's, it's a more tangible way to multiply, uh, you know, uh, building more diverse leadership within the company. So it, and I believe it's an open program that any company can take a pledge, uh, like their leadership can take a pledge and they can, they can adopt that program through, um, um, you know, through the, uh, through the leadership um, in order to advance more diverse talent, um, you know, uh, forward. That's brilliant. And how do people join? Is there like, a, what is it called or how do, how would people find it? So I can, um, I can, I would love to share. Um, we can share it in the comments. Yes, I can, I can share in the comments. So, I mean, and we I, could, I, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying that it, this is, this is the guideline, you know, for the companies who would like to adopt and how different companies adopt within their, their, their setting. It's, I believe it's it's kind of up to them. Um, I was um, selected for the program um, by the sponsor, um, who was who probably looked at me, you know, working and how I was performing, and he was already doing a pledge for this program. And then he uh, basically reached out to me, and I then I found out. But um, there are also ways like sponsees can also present their names that they would like to be part of this program and they're looking for a sponsor who is willing to invest in them. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a great initiative. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. And um, I wish we had three more hours because we've literally just scratched the surface, uh, but I'm conscious of time. And we've also got a few questions that have come in from our participants. And um, so I just wanted to give uh, the, the panelists a, a, a quick chance to any closing remarks or anything that you want to sort of say before we close up. Anything from you, May? Um, yeah, I would say that um, evidence has proven that um, gender diversity is very important to any company and the bottom line. And of course, uh, McKinsey had a research that showed that the most diverse companies are 21% more profitable than those who are not diverse. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, <laughs> perfect point to leave it at. Anybody else wanted to say anything last before we close? I'm interested to see the questions. I've been reading yes. some of them. They're really interesting. And the one uh, thing that I will add, you know, just like May mentioned, so um, especially in tech, um, I would say that innovation and diversity goes hand in hand. And when we limit who can participate in building the future and innovative solution, we also limit the, you know, um, the innovation. So I'm also really looking forward to what kind of questions we will be getting. As part of yeah, this. so we've got a question from Paula and she says, can we actually achieve gender equality in a patriarchal society? Anybody uh, I, yeah, I can answer that. Uh, NOSFA, the Arab Institute for Women's Empowerment, uh, has a pillar that we focus on. It's called Connect. And this is a pillar where we work to bring down social barriers that are getting in the way of women's advancement. So we have a podcast called Most Voices, and this is where we bring in men and women because it's absolutely necessary for men to be with us in this process. It's, we cannot do it alone. 
so we we identify male champions to do that and we talk about success setbacks challenges and we celebrate the men who support the women in this with that social barriers slowly come down and people start to engage as a society for us it's all about bringing uh closing that gap and moving that economic needle great and, and another question that's sort of on a on a, on a similar um kind of if they want to if we can ex explain or talk a little bit about the topic of the un unconscious behavior of mansplaining and how women are, are questions for having a, a question for having an opinion can I, can I address that? So that's actually very interesting. In our um, uh, fair employment policies, we have we go through a lot of um, uh, training. And in the training, we talk about um, some behaviors that make others feel uncomfortable. So that doesn't necessarily mean that someone did something completely wrong, but it just means that you need to kind of uh, explain to them that uh, what they're doing is kind of a demotivating. Um, uh, it's, it might be kind of, um, uh, it's, it might be t taken personally, which is totally okay. So if I am a completely competent person in my field and someone who's from a different field comes up to me and tries to explain to me why, you know, something is is important, you know, mansplaining. Um, I, you know, I try to address uh, the behavior rather than the point itself, um, and that's something that we we um, we often tell um, our employees. Um, we advise them that um, they should follow that those kinds of uh, behaviors. And expressing opinions is another. I mean, May talked about pushing cultural boundaries, and I completely agree. We are. We are. Um, the culture today is different from two years ago, and it's going to be even more different than um, in the near future and then the far future. So uh, we don't know how far we can stretch, stretch those lines, those boundaries, unless we actually push them. Um, so if you talk to someone about, you know, if you express your opinion and someone is kind of taken aback, it's okay. Me personally, I, I, I always advocate for kind of saying, um, why are you surprised that I did well? Why are you surprised that um, I'm expressing my opinion so openly, so openly with you? Um, and to have that discussion makes them kind of consciously think um, uh, about these topics. Yeah. And there's also another great question, which is something that comes up quite frequently. And it's about how do we treat the jealousy amongst other women? Um, I, I can answer that. Um, there's always the assumption that women are always competing with each other and they don't compete with men. It's because there are so many limited spots for women up the corporate ladder. So there's one seat up there. And so they, they put these women so they can compete for that one position. That doesn't help anyone. So make sure that there's enough seats for everybody and you'll see them support each other. Yeah. No, that's absolutely. I completely agree with that. Um, there's another question about, you know, if you are put in a position with your male teammates where you feel left out or neglected, how do you deal with that situation? What are some of the things that you can do? I can answer that too. Great. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, 29 years I've been in a male dominated industry. So, and it's bound to happen a lot. So you just learn to work by yourself slowly, slowly, um, uh, it will defrost and you'll start to be part of the team. But but uh, be comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm. Can I and, add to and that? Nowadays, well? nowadays um, women, uh, there is, I mean, there's much more women in this day and time in Saudi Arabia I'm talking about compared to the days that I used to work in, in, in the energy company so so the, and women i've noticed are much more assertive much more out there so i'm not worried about them i think they're 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 um way out there and and they're fearless yeah absolutely and if i may add just a small piece of um being yourself um you know we talked previously about um uh, how sometimes we kind of behave differently because we're around a different group of 
people and we maybe we want to kind of um, uh, adopt some of the more masculine traits that to kind of be more like them and the more you become yourself the more comfortable you are with um, you know your behaviors the people around you but that also um, like uh, May said uh, defrosts with time and men kind of uh, not only adapt, but learn to kind of uh, really work with um, a, a completely different set of skills and behaviors and uh, ways of doing business. Uh, and um, uh, coming from my own personal experience, and I've seen the more successful study women in, um, uh, in Sabic uh, apply the same thing. The more they become themselves, the more successful they are, and the more the men around them become uh, more invested in their careers and, um, and and their ideas and business. Yeah, no, it really is a win-win. So we just have to keep doing it. But unfortunately, we're out of time. So there were a few questions that we didn't have a chance to answer. So we'll try to get back to you uh, via email with those uh, with those answers afterwards. And I just want to say a huge thank you to to our panelists for sharing their amazing experience. And of course, this is a topic that we can talk about at nauseum. Um, so we'll hopefully have a chance to continue these conversations uh, offline as well. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Absolutely fascinating discussion. And it, it looks like we can do a lot more. This conversation could go on and on, and uh, it would be great to build upon this. Uh, we want to say a huge thank you to our audience uh, for participating, as well as our panelists. Uh, all of you, thank you so much. Uh, Mayal Mazani, founder and CEO of the Arab Institute for Women, NOS. Uh, Huma Hamid, our Cisco Program Manager for Engineering. Shada Shamari, HR Business Partnership at, at SABIC. And Maria Hago, uh, founder and CEO of Transform 8. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a fascinating pleasure to have you all on the on this uh, panel discussion. And thank you to Nama as well, in, in partnership with Nama, this, uh, this has been possible. So uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, we look forward to you engaging with Pearl Initiative much more. I know we're out of time at the moment, but please do continue to tune in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.